Welcome in, everybody. Happy Monday. Thank you for joining me for another five minutes with Sean, maybe 10. Today is Chris Martinez. He's written books about how to be a retail genius. He's showing people every single day. Now that he's gone from Austin, Texas to Tulsa, Oklahoma with Jackie Cooper Imports, he's proving, as he said on the show, you put him anywhere, he's going to sell a bunch of cars. Guy's got a proven system. The way he talks is so elegant when he talks about the car business. He loves it so much, but the process is what really, really seems to uh, get him going. So this week is all about process people. Uh, Chris talks about how he does it. And again, if you haven't checked out his books, do so. Uh, most of all, thank you so much for joining. Had another run of interviews here. Next week, we'll be back in the saddle uh, running solo. But uh, in this, this week, sit back and enjoy Chris Martinez. Thanks a lot. Welcome in, everybody. Another five minutes with Sean, maybe 10 sit-down edition, which means sit down and get ready because we're not going to be going 10 minutes. We're probably going closer to an hour. I am joined today by Chris Martinez, Director of Operations for Jackie Cooper Imports, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and someone I've just been in awe of for a long time. I'm glad I got him on the show. Chris, how are you, man? I'm good, man. How you doing? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, let's just start off here with kind of the, the high-level Right now, Chris, how long, what, what's your automotive history, man? Give us the high level. That's what we do when we bring guests on. What is, how long have you been in the business and, and how did it all start for you? I've been in the business for a little over 17 years now. Uh, I started my career at CarMax and uh, was able to help uh, when they started. When I started there, they had about 30 stores. When I left, we had over 100 stores. Um, and I helped them, you know, anytime they had store openings, I'd go out and do some store openings. I was a manager there for about six years, and then I left there. We ended up going to uh, San Antonio, and I was at, uh, at Universal Toyota. It was another Toyota store, and I went from being a manager for six years to, you know what, I'm going to go sell some cars, and I went back on the floor, and um, man, I killed it. Sold a lot, of, a lot of cars, 30 cars a month, made some money, and then the GM became a buying partner at the a Toyota store in Austin, Texas called Charles Mont Toyota. And he brought me over there and that store was doing about 150 cars a month when I got there or when we both got there. And uh, when um, we took it within four years, over a thousand cars a month, I think our best month was 1,056 or 1,053. I forget, it's been, it's, it's been- In 30 bit. days, Chris, <laughs> yeah. a normal 30 day month. 30 day. 1,056 cars. Yeah, single point. Yeah, single one point Toyota store. store selling 1,000 cars. Yeah, it was good stuff, man. Well, yeah, I, we would that, so. we, I would, I would say so. Uh, I would say the owner was probably one of the happier guys in Texas. He was pumped up, man. We were, uh, and it was, we did that several times. It wasn't just like a one-hit wonder. It was several times. That year, uh, we, we got uh, 10,837 cars, maybe. It was something like that. It was um, almost eleven thousand cars. We were we were shot. We didn't hit our. We didn't hit. We were shooting for eleven thousand. But you we, came up short. We came up a little short. Dude, either way, that that is some impressive impressive stuff. So when you went back to selling cars, because I've always told joked about the fact that if I ever went back to retail, I'd find the most beautiful place in America and just sell cars again. Uh, with social media, CRMs, BDC, oh, yeah. I don't have to do anything, right? It's not like in 98 when I was selling cars and had to do everything. Um, so uh, what, what, what brought that decision out? Was it just, was it just a change? Was it stress? Kind of why, why go from manager to sales? So my, um, at, at CarMax, if you wanted to grow there a little bit more, you, you'd have to be willing to move anywhere, right? My, my wife at the time didn't want to move anywhere. And when I found out that the, at a Toyota dealership across the street, they were making three times what I was making as a manager in, in sales. I said, you know what, I, I'm going to go try that out. So, and, um, and when I interviewed with them, sure enough, everybody, I mean, they pulled out their W2 or their pay stubs and everybody was showing me their pay stubs. And I was just like, man, this is, I'm going to, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. And, uh, sure enough, we, um, I got there and just we, I did real well. You know, first year I think I, I broke 150 grand as a salesman. 
And then um, we were sell I was selling about 20 or 30 plus cars a month and I was making about 20 grand a month. And, um, and I just was like, man, selling cars, this is it. I'm never going to not sell cars. Right. And, uh, it was good. And then from there, you know, after I left, um, Austin, we, I came over, I'm over here now in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And you know, it's funny. I always, I always joked and I've always told people, I said, look, man, you know what? I'm, I'm pretty confident in what I do. I, I truly believe if you drop me anywhere, on the planet that sells cars, I'm gonna sell a lot of cars, I promise you. And, um, and sure enough, I was able to put that, you know, my, my money where my mouth was basically, and I moved up here. And um, in the last 12 months, uh, we've been able to grow this group. It's a Porsche, Mercedes, Infinity, and a Nissan. And talk about, you know, a couple of tough brands there. Uh, yeah. And there is a couple. Let's be speaking of one in particular. It's probably the <laughs> toughest of that grouping, but yeah, for sure. Uh, I was with them back in, I was with that brand when it was real bad back in 03 before they really started to redo their inventory and find out their identity. So I'm with you there. And it looks like there's a G Wagon sitting behind you yeah. uh, in, in your, in your, in your, uh, in the glass behind you there. So, yeah. uh, you know, those aren't that bad to look at all day. So no, they're not. They're not. But, uh, when I got, they were selling them average 400 use or 400 cars a month, new used everything, uh, across the, across the group. And now we've been averaging, um, about 550 cars a month. So. It's All right. Been so we've talked about big growth numbers, which I'm always a fan of what I like to call the, the vanity of the whole thing, but how did you do it, Chris? I mean, is it, is it, is it something you've done? You've tried and tested, you continue to install, install. I mean, walk me through, if you can, I get, Oh yeah. You, you know, wait, you've written a book, so there's it, no secrets anymore. It, you already no told secret. everyone how to do it. And even if you tell them, doesn't mean they're going to listen. So right. why don't you tell me? Cause I'm gonna, uh, how did you do it? It's, it's really one, you got to have a ownership and leadership that, that want to do it. Right. If they don't, if you don't have them that, that want to that do it, I mean, the ownership here, these guys have been super amazing. Um, but the, Chris, does buy-in mean autonomy? Or how, how, do, you, how do you balance buy-in? Because I, I've been in situations where people had buy-in, but then when it came time to make a decision, it was like, I don't know if I can do that. You know, like, how do, how do you balance that in your position? Well, that's, that's the deal. They, when I talk about buy-in, like, there's no, no holds barred. Like, well, I'm, I'm going to give you these recommendations, and we got to execute on it. Like, yeah, so they're not gonna, recommendations. They're they're what we're they're what we're gonna do. Like this is what, what's gonna happen. Right? Yeah. Okay. I like it. I like it because that's important for people to hear. Because oh. you know, people get sold the dream all the time from owners who are like, yeah, 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 come work for me. I'll let you do whatever you want. And the second you try to do something, they go, oh, you can't possibly do that. So oh. all right, cool. So buy in from ownership number one. Well, you know, that's one of my books I wrote specifically. You have to and and a my editor was trying to tell me not to put it in. And I said, you know what, you, you have to put this in, you know, it really comes down to your, your, the people that you work for they, they, or the, the owners have to have brass balls. Like they've got to be like, no, that this is, this ain't, it's not easy. And it's, it, it's going to be, it's going to feel scary because it's uncomfortable, but you're going to have, you, you got to have that, you know, that grit that, you know, it's going to happen. You, know? you got to have the foresight. Now, I guarantee yeah. you, if we brought one of your owners on this show right now and asked him how he feels 12 months later, he would be elated. And I'm sure he would talk to you oh, about yeah. what you just said. He'd probably say month one through three, he thought to himself, how can I do this? Right. But then by month four or five, he started to see things change Then six, eight, and now you're 12 in. So Chris, that ownership buy-in wonderful. How do you come in though and deal with new people who don't know Chris and don't have buy-in to his way? I grant ownership buys in, but what's the next step? It's a, uh, you know, it's funny you say that because a lot of a lot of people that get, get into a position where I'm in, they they do it real easy. They come in, they clean house, they fire everybody and bring, bring in their, their guys, guys, right? Which you don't have because you didn't come from here, so you ain't got guys that so, you know you got to build up what you got. So I could have I could have brought some people from Austin or other places sure. for sure, but you know the owner first thing he told me was Chris, I want you to make sure you you keep um, keep the same team. I, I want you to grow them and uh, and do what you can. And and to me, when I 
I, when I heard that, I said, man, it's a challenge. I, th- I think that's going to be good. Sure. And, um, and the good thing is he's, he's hired already a really good staff, good people, very, I don't even know how to explain it. These, these guys are just real personable and, um, and they just want to win, you know, they just, um, and do they have loyalty to ownership? Do you sense that that's a part of it? That they yeah. want to do well because the people who write their checks. Yeah. Well, you got to think um, all these G- GMs here have all been with the, the company for 20 years, 20 plus years. One of them's been with the whole family for 34 years. Another guy's been here 20 years. Another guy's been here 28 years. And, um, and so when you think about that, they've been here this long. I mean, that's that's something said. I mean, that's, yeah, that is not something you hear in automotive, dude. That's how you like. That's tenure type stuff, right? Like, no way. But again, this goes back to what you and I were talking about on the pre-show. Tulsa being a smaller knit community, you feel that in your dealerships. You see the way they employ people. So that is awesome, awesome to hear. So you you obviously wouldn't. I mean, twenty five year GMs, you you're not going to change them out. But how interesting that you get put in that position, Chris. Yeah. To come in and tell dudes who've been doing it longer than you for the people you're doing it for, kind of how you expect to change. How did that go, man? It was, I mean, what's good is they, they, they wanted to. They, they, they read my book, which was cool. Uh, it was kind of good to, to hear. Was it required they, reading, Chris? When, when, when the owner said you were coming on board, did he come in and say, all right, everyone go out and get the book? No. Okay. no, no I, I would have done that. I would have said, look, I'm bringing in someone so impressive. They've written books. Go read them. Have a nice day. But uh, all right. So, all right. So everyone had already kind of had some background on you kind of knew where you were headed. So that, that helped, right? Sure. So that, yeah, they, they saw that and it's not, there was no fluff in the book. It's, it's all real. I mean, it's, it's what happened. Um, and I basically just wrote it out. I said, look, we're going to tighten up some processes. We're going to tweak some things and it, we're just going to, we're going to try to get people to that, that level that they should have been doing already. And, and it's things they already know. It's just, now we're just going to tighten it up and we're going to do it every day. Like I have. Uh, Reinforcement accountability. I mean, that's really what people need. They just need to know that someone else is with them along the way. Yeah. And that's it. And you know, and I look at, looked at all the numbers, you know, when you, you know, I always talk about knowing your numbers. I mean, every day you, you got to come in I got my, my game plan right here. I know I've got it here and we're going to go over them. And, and how are we going to improve and, you know, appointments, calls, all of it. Like where, where are we at and how are we going to move the number? So yeah, we, it's not, it's not good enough anymore to just know the trend of the sales trend. It's not it, it, because you know how many you're pacing for means nothing to me because most people don't know the math previous to that, right? You don't know how many shows it took you to get there. You don't know how many phone calls it took you to get there. You're worried about a result that, really is is kind of the last result that I care about. I, I want to see the activity that leads to the results. Is that a, is that a similar approach Absolutely. for you? Absolutely, yeah. And then when you look at, just looking at even um, to the details of, of the finance PRU, right? When you're looking at what's your per copy, okay, well, let's look at all your margins and how do you compare with your peers and then how do you compare with your other similar size stores and let's get all the data. Once Once you start really bringing in the data from, other like size dealers and just showing, comparing them, uh, almost kind of like a 20 group style. I, thing. Dude, I was just about to say to you, so you're running an internal 20 group. That's a badass idea for multiple reasons, uh, especially now. Um, but, but, but for that, 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 that idea of that, when you have these meetings, is it, are you doing it as one-offs or are all the GMs yourself in a room where you're all discussing and everyone can physically see and talk? How does that go? It's, it goes a, a one-on-ones every day. Okay. And, I, and I mean, it's when I say daily one-on-ones, some of the guys are probably like, Chris, okay, I get it. You, you know, you know they're, they're probably like tell, talking, talking smack behind their, behind closed doors and be like, man. It's okay. <laughs> but it's six days a week, Monday through Saturday of daily one-on-ones. And we're going through, well, why didn't this happen yesterday? What, what can we do to, to build upon this? And, and it's not MFing anybody. It's just, Let's talk about it. Let's see how we can get through it and how, how, how can we get better every day? And now, is it just high level or are you in, are you in with, with managers as well? Like you, do, you, do you kind of give the message to the GM and it's their job to kind of hold dailies with their guys or how do you, how do you expect the rest of the cog? 
So I sit down with the general managers every day and then I go one-on-one -on -one with the sales managers. I'll, I'll talk to them, see how they're doing. I pass by, I talk to salespeople to try to hear what they're talking about. What are they saying? Are they getting feedback from their managers? Stuff like that. So it's from the top down, just, you know, inspect what you expect, right? Yeah, but it's incredible accountability, Chris. And a lot of people in your position um, don't do it. A lot of people in your position have the job. As you said, they've taken the easy route. They cleared house. They brought in people they knew who were going to do whatever it is that they do. That doesn't always mean they do the right thing. Let's be clear about that. Um, but for you, you, you come into a situation with established teams, but a dealership that needs to grow. Where, where did you start? Like, what was, the, what was the first thing when you looked at these brands? How did you, how did you decide your path forward? Well, I, you know, I always look at the, the low hanging fruit first, right? And once you, I, I always, I run about four reports every day. I look at my sales history, um, you know, metrics, desk manager report, all of that compiled into one. I look at the finance producers, what their metrics are. I look at my inventory and I look at my close ratios on phone, internet, walk-in, repeat referral, stuff like that. Okay. Wow. And those four reports I, I have on a daily basis and, and, it, and it really shows you, tells a story of where you need to tweak your, your processes, where you need to tighten, tighten things up. Uh, if I don't look at my inventory on a daily basis, I don't know that I've got 40 cars in, in my service department that are bottlenecked and, and they're still sitting there and there's no cars up front and I need to get that up front online and so I can help generate more leads and get my you know, my, our team, um, selling more, you know, and if you don't know where anything's at, I mean, that it's, it really gives you the, the heartbeat of the dealership. You, you go through those reports and you, you manage by them. And I know you can be a software guy. Do you have a software that you like for that bottleneck piece over the years? It was always one of the more frustrating things for me when I ran stores, which was, you know, I get a car in and then all of a sudden, you know, every day it's not on the front lot is a day that costs somebody somewhere money, right? So my thing was always like, why is this happening? And this was early 2000s, so I didn't have all the tech that's there. Is there any tech you use to, to keep an eye on that sort of thing? Well, we use Reynolds, and uh, Reynolds has a report that we have. Um, there is some good software out there. Uh, Trace Recon, I think they're now Recon Velocity, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not sure. Uh, but it's a pretty good little uh, software. We had it for a period, uh, but the tool the Reynolds has this report and I just, we pull it out. It's, it's part of the, the millions of dollars that we, we pay that company. Yeah, yeah, no, you should not have to hire more tech, dude. Not, uh, not if you've already paid one. That's for sure. So, so you know, you try to, you know, you, it, you, there's definitely cost control or expense control. You want to make sure you're doing it smart. You don't want to overspend. So I, I you know, where I can cut spend expense, I, I, I will. Um, but, I'm not afraid to spend money where I know we're going to get the, the biggest bang. For well, let's, that, that's a perfect segue. So how have you handled spending and people over the last six months? Have you had to lay people off? Have you had to cut your expenditures by half? Like what have you experienced in the last, you know, in the, in the pandemic season that we are, I guess, still in, but for the most part, uh, how, how's it gone? Well, the, the pan, during the pandemic, we, we didn't uh, lay anyone off, which is, which is awesome. The, the owner uh, made a decision, said, you know, I'm, I'm true to my people. I'm gonna, we're going to keep everybody, and we're going we're gonna to weather this storm. And um, we did go to, like, half scheduling. So half of us got scheduled. The other half were, like, it was, like, a rotation, two on, two off, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, uh, but luckily, we were able to stay open the whole time because we were were uh, essential, right? Um, but you know, uh, we we stayed the course. You know, I, I, we made sure that everybody was on the phones, and we were handling customers, helping customers, uh, lower expenses, um, helping them through service, and we actually saw an increase in sales. Believe it or not, uh, during the shutdown, and then uh, the, the following month, another increase and. I, I, you're, I assume you're referencing year over year increase, right? Cause that's obviously yeah. what, that, that's the channel you're against currently. Yes. Year over year. So, so now Chris, now in, now in your situation, year over year, you've gone set records during a pandemic, which is fun to do, but let's fast forward 12 months when Chris is no longer against someone else's history. 
Chris is now against his own history starting, I think you said next month, uh, right? That'll be your 13th month, which means now we're up against kind of what you've been doing. Um, how do you, how do you then get to the next growth or is it all because of the reinforcement and accountability you do daily that will just slowly chip away and the number will move on its own or do you have something planned to move it the next needle? Well, by now, so now that these 12 months are pretty much over, the next month, it's, it's just always building on that, right? So, and, and I, I don't look at, you know, an increase year over year so much as how are we, are we short up in all of our areas? Are we short up on the amount of staff we have, the amount of inventory we have? Where are all my inefficiencies or deficiencies that I can increase to help drive that number? And, you know, it's, it's just going to be a continuation like this until we, we, we hit a plateau in land, which we have plenty of land, and, um, or, or the lack of uh, access to inventory. So, which again, uh, you're, you're a professional segwayer, dude. Here you are, right? Um, so, yeah, now inventory is the biggest hot button discussion in the country. Everyone now is going to start doing the trade in, trade ups. Everyone's trying to go to the curb to get them. Chris, how are you dealing with it, man? What are you doing? Just we're going to all the same auctions everyone else is, but I'm the, we're the guys that are, are keeping our hand up. You know, we're just, you just got to buy them, right? Paying retail to sell retail because at the end of the day, I need, to, I need to get a trade from the retail. That's what I was having a discussion with a used car manager a couple of days ago who he's just, he's a gross guy. So he doesn't, he's like, I just, I gotta, I gotta slow down buying. I said, no, man, you gotta think about gross on the third car or the second car. If we can get the trade in, cause they're gonna have one. If they want a new used car, they're gonna bring me something. You don't need wholesalers anymore. Get them out of your lives. Keep, I don't care what it is. Keep it, safety check it, and, and sell it. Um, you, are you noticing any upticks anywhere, Chris? You seeing any different acquisitions from the curb or from customers coming in? Because as I tell people, because I, like you, personal friends, you know, you give them advice. As like the stock market, your car has never been worth more than it is right now. If, if it's a used car you buy. Oh, absolutely. If you think you're upside down go to a car dealership and make sure you're upside down because you just might not be. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm looking at customers that were in the market in October, November, coming back that didn't buy, coming back and we're offering them the same or more on the cars that they had appraised back in October, November. I mean, that's eight months ago. I mean, that, that, yeah. they think they're put on a thousand miles of car. 10 more thousand miles on it and you're like nope yep same number no more money yeah i mean and, and again the, the the equity you buy on that side of it right when you have the customer see that and feel that are you are you seeing them sort of be less is it less about the new car price when the you when the, when the trade-in price can be so good is it less of that or are you are you feeling how are you seeing people has anything changed with their negotiation style i guess is what i'm trying to say you know because inventory online has been not as robust as it was in say January, February. I think customers aren't getting enough of a variety of uh, actual inventory online. So when they're coming in, they're just, you know, I'm not, you know, we, we have a no hassle model, uh, although we still will, you know, discount a car from time to time, depending on, you know, current situations with the consumer. Um, we, I mean, can you just delve a little deeper into the no hassle model? I like, cause right when you said the terminology, I'm like, okay, I already like this more. Cause he didn't say one price. That isn't what he said. Cause I've been in one price stores, dude, where people walk deals over $250. And I want to pull my hair out. I want to go running out to the customer. Be like, no, no, I'll pay the 250. Just come back inside. Don't worry about it. You know, and I was working for the OEM. So I, talking about the no hassle procedure, cause I have a feeling this is what's setting you apart from other people in your area. If it's a value add. So what is it? Well, so it's, uh, it's market-based pricing is what we educate. Okay. And we say, look, we've got to be competitive. We put our best prices online. Um, there are no hassle, no haggle. Um, but, you know, if, if push comes to shove and, you know, there's some, you know, we, they, we need a little bit more for the trade or something, we'll, we'll make, we're going to make the deal. You know, we're not going to let a customer walk on $200. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But, I do know what you're saying. And that's important to me that we're all doing that because we just shouldn't walk car deals <laughs> over $200, especially inside of our PMA. Are you noticing that, uh, are you seeing more activity outside your PMA? Recently, people oh. coming into market from other areas, maybe that weren't getting the same level of service or that weren't as comfortable during the pandemic, et cetera? 
we buy such unique cars at our Mercedes location that I've never seen more people buy from California, Oregon, Florida, New York, New Mexico. Oh, I so mean, you can make deals without people being in your showroom, Chris? This is very odd. I, you know, I talk to dealers all the time who just can't even think about penciling a deal over the phone. But here you are. Do you guys offer delivery? Do you, do you help them handle all the, the front to back? Do you have people that you deal oh, with? Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. So he sells cars to anyone, folks. Yeah, Writes anyone. books, ships cars anywhere. Jackie Cooper Imports, obviously the place to be there. Um, Chris, what's the size of, of, your, of your staff right now? Like how, how is, you said no one got laid off, so staff size hasn't contracted. So what do you, per hundred cars sold, how do you set up a store? Well, right now we have 54 salespeople at, at all, between all the groups. Um, so my the Mercedes store has 20, one salespeople the actually we have 55 we have 55 so uh, between mercedes porsche um mercedes and porsche sit on one location but it's two big separate buildings and then nissan is on its own uh, lot and then infinity's on its own lot as well and um the, well the reason why i get to go to all these stores too is because they're all on the same street so I can drive, you know, to be there two minutes at any other other store, which makes it easy. Yeah. Um, so what's the I, point of having an office, right? You just use their offices and you <laughs> peek in, you do that. Otherwise, you just sit in a corner somewhere. I understand that. But we have 55, 55 salespeople. So, you know, we averaging 550 cars a month. Um, in June, or no, no, May, we sold 580 cars uh, with that same amount of sales staff. And on a rotator, was that, was that still during a rotating schedule in May? No, it was a full no. schedule at that point. Full schedule. Okay. Got yeah. it. Got it. Um, are you a BDC guy? Or are you, how do you, how do you handle your internet leads? What's your, what's your deal there? So we have a BDC, but it's um, the salespeople handle it from start to finish. But we do have some BDC agents that do help facilitate some of the lead handling. Uh, but for the most part, the sales staff handles it from the beginning to the end. Does your BDC work more on the fixed op side or is it, or do you, is it just the sales when they need well, it? We have another BDC that handles just fixed ops. Got it. Got it. Crazy. All right. So BDC credit to grave salespeople. So there's some assistance, if you will, some people who help you get along the way. Um, do they, do they work leads in a bullpen style, Chris, where they go into a BDC or are they just have them at their desks and it's just a part of their workflow in their daily lives? They, there's an actual, bullpen type thing where they all, all the, all the leads and all the phone ups go to that business development center. So you rotate your salespeople in by schedule. Yes. That's the best. That's the best because the reason it's the best and I've always loved the bullpen approach is because there are no distractions. When yeah. you are in the bullpen, you have the job is contact a customer and get them to our dealership. That is it. Cause if you're on the floor, God forbid a you know service customer walks in or any it doesn't matter a friend of a friend it doesn't matter I love that idea um, is that do you, do you do you find it to be a good thing to have the bullpen versus just kind of in the free world it's the it's the method I've used for ever and I think it's the, for 17 years we used that that method and um, it's worked I mean I've seen other methods where you hire BDC agents and they handle this the, the appointments and all that and then salespeople just help them when they get here um and i've just i've never i've seen it be a pretty effective in some stores but i've just never really been a fan of that one I, it can I be like tough it. cost effectiveness too chris if you're a budget guy if you're a numbers guy which i know today is one of it was one of my favorite days i love statement day uh, i love going through them all and just being like wow that was not good or this was good or whatever but um being a numbers guy i think the bdc if you don't run it efficiently it becomes impossible to pencil and then you waste more money creating it to just can it so i tell people last week on my show i had a bdc uh cat from canada sean armor and it was the same discussion why bother spending the money if you're not gonna as you started off our show with talking about commitment buy-in brass balls to move forward. If you don't have those, then just don't bother. Just do whatever it is that you're doing now because it seems like you'd waste more. Um, when you got there, was that, was that how they were doing business? The BDC bullpen environment or is that the Chris Martinez kind of sprinkle on top of this deal? 
Yeah, they basically, salespeople could answer them from their desk. No, but nobody was at the BDC. Like they just, there was no, there, there wasn't a BDC. There, there was a BDC that I guess, cause there was a BD agent. Sure. Uh, but some poor 22 year old just sitting there hammering on phones. Not sure what to do. Yeah. Sounds about right, dude. Sounds about right. Um, so when you, when you look at salespeople, so you've got, I mean, look, you've got an average of 10 cars a guy, right? Sounds like 550, 55 guys. Um, what's the variable there? Do you have your 25s and your 10s or how, like, how does the salesman, are they all pretty fair across the board? Or do you have some guys that just absolutely stand out, been there a long time, have a big book of business? You know, there's uh, we don't have any, we have a, a couple people, you know, several, several people in the 18 and 20 car range. Um, we have one guy who sold 27 cars, uh, but that's, that's really it. Aside from that one month, he sold 27, which he's, he's the best one we have in the group. Um, I think he's, he's consistently around 20 cars a month. Um, and is he taking fresh or, I mean, is he, is he taking fresh jobs? Is he in the bullpen or is he pretty much on his own book? He's, uh, he's about 50, 50, okay. so, which I think he could do even more to be honest with you. I think he could, if he really just kind of honed in that, you know, in which direction could he do more? Could, do you mean he could take less fresh, be working more on a schedule with his own customers? Yes. Yeah. That would make sense for everyone. Right. Oh, um, yeah. How do you handle social media policies? Because obviously it's a big push right now. People say get on organic social media, post, post, post. Do you have any sort of uh, feedback there, Chris? I know you're, I know you're always active doing things. Is there anything you look at there? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm all about social media. So we, for, for salespeople, I, I recommend that they post their stuff online, tag people on there, do the whole thing. Uh, but from us as a business, we, we spend, a, we spend quite a bit making sure that, um, all of our brands are represented well, and we've got some some videos out there every month going out daily um, on every different types of little filters that we use. Yeah, so you're having fun with it. Do you have a department for that, Chris, or is it on the salespeople? How does that culture of marketing kind of come to a head in your in your position? So I I don't leave the videos on the salespeople that they can do videos, they can tag the dealership, they can do all that. Uh, which is super effective. Um, but uh, the, the other videos, I have a marketing company that, that will create the videos for us and we, we push them out. Um, right. But recently, I've been having more of our sales staff just create those videos because we're trying to do more audiences and just, you know, micro targets to different uh, subsets and getting a lot more reach and frequency there. Yeah, that's really cool. And I, I would tell you, one of the other things that we started doing recently that we thought was pretty cool was also bringing in, if you're going to go super regionalized into specific cities, I don't know, I don't know if that's what you're referring to, but I know that's a, becoming even more hyper-targeted. We're actually putting the name of the city in the video. And we're finding this very weird kind of connection, especially if we show a map versus like, hey, we're actually only 20 minutes from where you think we are. Um, it's been really dialing in. I, so when did you start micro-targeting to that depth? Was it due to pandemic or was that already something you were doing six months ago? I, actually, it's something we've been doing even when I was at the Toyota store. Um, okay. It's part of how we, we ended up building some of the so software that I've, I've been building for the last um, five plus years now. Because again, it's not enough to write books and be a superstar at retail, but you also have to be an up and coming tech star. It's unbelievable. You see, this is why I wanted to have you on because everyone needs to aspire to be Chris Martinez uh, in, in all ways if they can. Um, when, when you look at your, your marketing efforts, right, and how, how it's positioned, is it a lot about branding for you? Is it a lot about offers? Kind of what's, you, what's your mix and approach on marketing? I do a lot more branding style marketing because if I'm not on TV, TV is, is it would definitely be the offer, right? Um, but, you know, we, we try to keep a relatively low budget at each one of these stores. Um, so right now the, the highest of, or the highest reach and frequency we've been able to do at the lowest of, amount of money is sticking to the whole social channels. So yeah. YouTube, all that stuff that we're doing. Yeah. yeah. 
So that's the best way that you get the per views. Now, do you, are you into the digital TV world, the OTTs, the world? And to back up your last statement, are you doing any traditional kind of in conjunction with what you do online? In the last 12 months, we have done some OTT and some TV. Uh, but just recently, during, due to the pandemic, we switched all to digital. Okay. Got it. So you're doing pre-roll. That's your video piece that you get on the YouTube pre-roll, get in that world. That's that cool. and, and well, Facebook, Instagram, all the different social channels out there. That's awesome. It's awesome. And again, having your salespeople be involved in it has to, has to make sense, right? I've always said that it's a social wildfire. If I sell you a car and I tag you, then you're going to tag your friend. And God forbid, if I shot a video with you buying your car, right? I mean, if there's anything that you could be tangible, it reminds me, and this is not going to be lost on you. It's the evidence man, right? It's that big ass binder I had on my desk of all the pictures and handwritten. I mean, I think I still have it. Uh, but, but it's that with, with real life. You know what I'm saying? I, I just, do you ever, do you ever talk to salespeople and just kind of let them know how fortunate they are to sell in today's oh. environment? <laughs> All the time. I mean, it's so, I mean, I, you know, when I started at CarMax, it was in 2003, the internet, you know, was, I mean, it was good then. Um, but it the leads were like, coming in still via fax though. A little confusing, a little confusing <laughs> for internet leads, but we'll get there later for sure. But it, but now, I mean, it's, I mean, you can, you can find any of these customers. I mean, LinkedIn, you got anything, Facebook, man, you can find everything. The dealer raiders you know. of the world kind of creating these subculture pages, right? Where the guy can kind of take ownership of his own brand and, and be who he is. I, the opportunities are endless for them where they necessarily weren't for me or you, I guess. We sound like a couple of old guys. When you were with CarMax, was that still when they were doing new car brands? Or was that when they were starting to phase out of that? No, they still had the new car brands. And I mean, it was, I mean, to go from 30 cars or 30 stores to a hundred plus stores, I mean, it was, it was definitely growth. And right now I don't even know how many they have. I think it's a couple hundred stores now. It seems um, like for, it seems like everywhere I go, I see one. It's crazy. Yeah, uh, living they, in Wisconsin, we've got like a CarMax Plex that they still have like a Toyota store and a Chevy store. And I'm always like, how did you guys keep those brands? I thought, I thought you guys got rid of them. Um, but uh, yeah, so Chris, let's, uh, I know you're busy. I, you've been already way gracious with your time today. Um, as you kind of move forward out of this, is there any lessons that you've learned over the last three months that are really going to stick with you and, and something that you say, hey, I'm, you know, silver lining type moments for you? Um, this, it just stink, sticking to the basics. I mean, they've always worked for me. And I mean, you just do do the, the basics of, of the deal of the actual making sure that you're, you're t talking to your customers, you're doing the necessary, you know, I've, there's a, a quote that I always like saying, and it's uh, do start with, by doing what's possible, then do what's necessary and, or no. Yeah. Start with doing possible, then do what's necessary. And suddenly you're doing the impossible. It's by Francis Asasi, I think is his last name. And, um, you know, you're always dropping those quotes, man. I love that about you. That's why I love following you on LinkedIn because you're always putting stuff out. The other day you put something out where it was like, look, if you're going to have your feelings hurt, don't read this. It was a, you know, it was a, I think it was, a, it was a, 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 a Gogan's one, right? And I was like, okay, wow, this is, and it was great. The whole point was, look, stop making excuses. Get out of your own way. Like it's, it's, it's one of the bigger things. Is that what kind of, is that part of your motivation i know I, I see it seems you're a big reader is that sort of where you start to pull your motivation that keeps you kind of driven every day yeah no i see what the the greats do and they're super disciplined you know you're, they're the stream you know be the stream they, they just stay consistent that perseverance and before you know it i mean i always tell my salespeople I, I wasn't when i sold cars i sold a lot of cars and i was the top salesman and um and I outsold most, I, I outsold everyone because, not because I was a better salesman, but because I put in more work, I, I made more phone calls, I followed up, I did everything that was required that I used to, would teach salespeople. Because when I was, I was a manager for many years and I went back to sales floor, I said, I'm gonna do everything I was telling my salespeople to do and I'm gonna do 10 times more than that, if that's even possible. Right. But you'd, but you'd already been back to the other side. So you knew what that meant when you said it, you knew what it was going to take to get there and you knew you could lead by example if you did. So I, man, again, I, I commend you for, for making that move back that way. Um, 
how did you settle on coming back in? Because I know you when you had left the Toyota store in Austin, that was kind of, you know, how, what was it about Jackie Cooper Imports that said, you know what, let's come out of, I won't call it retirement, right? We're in our 30s. But my point is, what, what made you come back into the space, man? So my, um, so, you know, I've read a couple books um, and the owner, uh, the partner of the, of the group, Joe Cooper, which is um, um, the son of Jackie Cooper. Um, so Joe Cooper, uh, he, great guy. Uh, he ended up reading one of my books a couple years ago. And for a little over a year, he was trying to, you know, he wanted me to come work with him, right? Um, and I was like, man, you know, Tulsa, I got to move, or in Oklahoma City, it was at the time. And, um, and I was like, man, I don't know that I want to move out there. It's just, you know, we're doing so well over here. Things are great. Right. And then once we, you know, once one of my, the partnerships that I had gotten into had dissolved, he called me out of the blue again. And I was like, man, I think I'm ready now. I think this is, we're, we're good. And yeah. he said, well, look, it's a perfect timing because my partner, he needs, um, he, he's looking for someone and um, it'd be great. So I, I met with his partner, super great guy. Um, he's, I mean, probably the nicest guy I've ever met. I mean, just super guy. In the car business, that's saying something, dude. That's saying something. People can, especially in those positions, people can tend to forget where they came from or they can have too much money or they can be the, the, the kids of the lineage dynasty. You know what I mean? There's, there's certain things that can make that relationship really sour. Uh, that's really great to hear that you did that. Uh, Chris, how long was the process? I mean, it sounds like there was a year of courting previously. And then once you were, once you had that call with him, how quickly till you got to Tulsa? The minute he was, he said, let's do it. The next day I, I found a place to, to lease and um, took, brought my wife. We drove down, took a look at it and we, we inked up the deal and that was it. That's it. That's it. Same way me and my wife moved to Colorado back in 2003. We just, we woke up in the mountains. She'd never seen him. She's like, I want to live here. I walked down to a Nissan store. It's like, you have a resume? I'm like, nope. Sold cars in Chicago for the last five years. Guy goes, you're hired. I said, great. I'll be back in 30 days. I got to sell a house. I didn't expect to do this on vacation. Went back home. My brother's like, hey, I'm having a kid. Need a house. I'm like, that's weird. I got a house I need to sell because I'm leaving. So I sold him my house and I was back in Colorado in 27 days. Um, wow. So I get, I get the urge, man, because when it happens, right, you, you know, it's the right time, you know, it's there. Um, and so it, that, that's great. Chris, leaving us kind of in the, as we go into the, into the closing this up, salespeople, you've done it. You've written books about it. What, is, what, what, what do you want them to hear? We get a lot of salespeople that watch our show. Um, so what, what is it that you want them to hear about selling? Forget today's market because it, it doesn't seem like it matters to you. It doesn't seem like it's a pandemic. It's cash for clunkers. It's any, it doesn't matter. It's Chris does business the way Chris does business. And nothing's going to change it. That's how I like doing things. What wisdom can you give salespeople? Man? Just, just keep the relationship, build a relationship. I think if you can couple a good process with forming that relationship, man, people will buy from you, whether you're cheaper, you're higher price that you form that relationship. They're going to want to do business with you. People buy people first. Uh, when they're doing the actual uh, looking, when they're when they're actually trying to buy those cars. When I look at look back on how many customers that I have come and bought from me, believe me, I, they know I'm going to give them a good deal, but they they know that I'm also going to take care of them after the sale and 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 follow up with them and check on them and just keep that relationship going because they're going to need their friends and family are going to need cars. They might have kids that will need cars someday. And that relationship, I mean, that's how you got guys like Frank Crenitti and um, the guys that sell, what's, uh, what's his name, Ali Retta, sell yeah. over 100 cars a month. They, that relationship is super important. And, and I don't know that people really understand the magnitude of that. And what I, what I love about Tulsa, it's very much that relationship. I can literally go to a, a corner store or the grocery store and I'll be waiting in line and people are trying to spark up a conversation. And I'm just, just sitting there. I'm just, and I'm not used to that coming from, from uh, Austin, you know, that nobody's trying to talk to you. Hey, look, man, I grew up in Chicago. There's no, no, one's, no one's trying to pick your brain while we're all sitting on the train. Like no one, no one cares about what it is you care about, right? So now I live in the middle of nowhere, Wisconsin, and I've, I, I had the same examples in my life where people just, 
it's just a different culture. It's different communities. It's the way that it works. But you bring up a, an interesting point. It's about building relationships for the long term. When, he, yeah. when, when Chris says that, salespeople, he doesn't mean build relationships in the moment and rush to selling them a car. He's talking about the relationship starts when the car is sold. In its, in, its, in its realness, it starts when it's sold and how you handle it afterwards. Um, Chris, were you, uh, were, were, what did you do? Anything fun you did on your follow-ups? I used to send birthday cards for the car. I always thought it was fun. I, that was my bit. Any bits you had or anything you did cool post-sale that people found unique? So I would send them uh, every month. They would get an actual dessert recipe from me. And uh, every month, every Everybody I ever sold a car to would get this different dessert. And it would be a picture of a really cool dessert, and, and it would have a recipe on how to actually make that dessert. And it was an email? It was a, it was a postcard? I mean, how, postcard. Does, how did one do this? It was a postcard. And I had my buddy, and I, not, he's not really, like, he's an acquaintance of mine. I got him through Sensations, is what the name of the company that just handled it all for me. And I just paid the 500 bucks a month, and... I, my face and, and that recipe was going to be in front of them every month. Desserts of the month. I mean, better better than jelly of the month. It's desserts of the month. And Chris has sent it to all of his customers. He yeah. carries, as a salesperson, any of you watching, if you just heard what he said, he's carrying a $500 overhead piece to go ahead and do it. And the reason I'm guessing Chris is willing to carry the $500 overhead is because he realizes the people he works for carry the other 98% of the overhead for him. From the computers he mentioned earlier that cost millions of dollars to the software that costs the same to the marketing that costs similarly, he pays it all from an ownership perspective and salespeople get to benefit from that. So salespeople, when someone says invest in your business, that's what they're talking about. They mean invest in yourself, which may mean financial. It may mean putting up money to send out the dessert of the month. But Chris was doing this to 30 cars a month times, let's just call it 10 months for easy math, 300 cars. There you go. Every single month, every single year, 300 more people are getting that message. You don't think they ever shared those? Come on. Right, Chris? All the time. All the time. You know, what's amazing is I used to have customers that would pull customers out of other stores and they would tell me, Chris, my, my buddy was at, the, at this other dealership. I'd tell him, stop what you're doing. I actually drove to the dealership, got out, got him in my car and drove. And here he is. And... And, and I've had people come in, Chris, I get all your desserts. I, uh, thank you. Those are so great. And it was, it was just something that they, they, you, you had that connection with them. They just, because they, they, because they, you set yourself apart, dude. No one was doing that. No, no one way. was doing that. No one was sending birthday cards like I did in the beginning where I was in the state I worked in. You could give out referrals. So I printed a bunch of business cards, $100 business cards with my face on it. And I'd walk away from the customer at the end of the delivery. I'd say, hey, by the way, enjoy the 500 bucks I left in your glove box. You wouldn't get but two steps. They go, you did what? And they go in there and they're like, oh, so funny. I'm like, no, really. And then within six months of working at that dealership, people started coming in with my picture on this car going, where's Sean? Well, I got two other customers. So then you look at your showroom, right? On a Saturday, people are working for you and you're like, I got half deal there, I got half deal there. I'm working two deals on my own. This is dope, man. This is how we roll. So uh, salespeople, if, if you have it, here's what I want to say, Chris. Give the salespeople the names of the books, man. You've written, I think, two. How can they Three. find them? Where can they find them? So you can go on Amazon. I've written uh, the, uh, the Drive to 30. That's for any salesperson that, you know, was always wanting to know how to get to 30 cars, 30 plus cars a month. Uh, and you don't have years to make those relationships right away. You want to just start from the ground running. Uh, that's that book. Uh, driving sales, what it takes to sell a thousand cars a month for the managers and, and salespeople that want to, you know, grow. Um, and then the unfair advantage. Um, and it's a marketing book on different strategies that you can use today to, to help some, it's more tactical advice that you can deploy today to try to sell more cars. Unbelievable, dude. Man, you have been so gracious with your time. We really, really appreciate it. Chris, where can people find you if they want to reach out to you after they've seen this episode? You can find me on LinkedIn or go to my website, chrisjosephmartinez.com. Um, and that's pretty much it. Facebook, I'm there. I'm everywhere. Instagram, Twitter, you can find me. The guy is everywhere. Folks, as you know, our show is pretty much primarily on LinkedIn. We do some Facebook. We have the YouTube channel. You can come check it out at. Um, but this interview, man, this was what I was looking forward to, Chris. You, you certainly delivered. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it.
I appreciate you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody go out, enjoy your week. And remember, it's going to take work, but Chris has written books to help you get there. Go find him and join us next Monday. Thanks. <laughs>